A reading from the book of Genesis. Abram was very rich in livestock, silver, and gold. Lot, who went with Abram, also had flocks and herds and tents, so that the land could not support them if they stayed together. Their possessions were so great that they could not dwell together. There were quarrels between the herdsmen of Abram's livestock and those of Lot's. At this time, the Canaanites and the Perizzites were occupying the land. So Abram said to Lot, Let there be no strife between you and me, or between your herdsmen and mine, for we are kinsmen. Is not the whole land at your disposal? Please separate from me. If you prefer the left, I will go to the right. If you prefer the right, I will go to the left. Lot looked about and saw how well watered the whole Jordan plain was as far as Zor, like the Lord's own garden, or like Egypt. This was before the Lord had destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. Lot, therefore, chose for himself the whole Jordan plain and set out eastward. Thus they separated from each other. Abram stayed in the land of Canaan, while Lot settled among the cities of the plain, pitching his tents near Sodom. Now the inhabitants of Sodom were very wicked in the sins they committed against the Lord. After Lot had left, the Lord said to Abram, Look about you and from where you are. Gaze to the north and south, east and west. All the land that you see I will give to you and your descendants forever. I will make your descendants like the dust of the earth. If anyone could count the dust of the earth, your descendants too might be counted. Set forth and walk about in the land through its length and breadth, for to you I will give it. Abram moved his tents and went on to settle near the terebinth of Mamre, which is at Hebron. There he built an altar to the Lord. The word of the Lord. He who does justice will live in the presence of the Lord. He who walks blamelessly and does justice, who thinks the truth in his heart and slanders not with his tongue. Who harms not his fellow man, nor takes up a reproach against his neighbor, by whom the reprobate is despised, while he honors those who fear the Lord. Who lends not his money at usury, and accepts no bribe against the innocent. He who does these things shall never be disturbed. Dominus Fabesco, Lexio Sancti Evangelii Secundum Matteum. Gloria Domine. 
Jesus said to his disciples, do not give what is holy to dogs or throw your pearls before swine, lest they trample them underfoot and turn and tear you to pieces. Do to others whatever you would have them do to you. This is the law and the prophets. Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the road broad that leads to destruction, and those who enter through it are many. How narrow the gate and constricted the road that leads to life, and those who find it are few. Ebum Domini. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, family disputes can often be the most acrimonious, especially when they're over money, power, or land. Today in the book of Genesis, we have probably a possible family dispute that is resolved concerning land by Lot and Abram when they come into the promised land and in a sense are the beginnings of the origin of the people of God. Abram demonstrates his justice in the responsorial psalm we read, he who does justice will live in the presence of the Lord by not insisting on his portion but saying there's plenty of room for both of them. And so he allows Lot, even though he's younger, to make the decision and the choice about what land he wishes. And then Abraham accepts his portion. And from these, of course, when the Lord founds the actual physical confines of Israel, the book of Genesis ends with, I will make your descendants like the dust of the earth. The descendants of Abraham and Lot in the Old Testament are those who now exercise authority in the New Testament. In the Old Testament, we had not yet received the Holy Spirit in our souls, though the law was true and the prophets actually encouraged us to do so from love of God. This is fulfilled in the New Testament. In the New Testament, the Holy Spirit dwells in the heart of the Holy Christian. And this is where it's written. It's not written on stone, on tablets. Of course, there are physical commandments that either bring us grace, like the sacraments, or have to do with us living in the presence of the Holy Spirit, like our moral teachings. But the emphasis is on the interior life, on loving God as he is to be loved as to who he is. Love is important. We emphasize love today. I have a Franciscan friend. He always says to me, remember, Father Brian, God is love. And I say, yes, he's also truth. Because we all know we can love falsely. People often have reference to their conscience, and they'll say, well, I'm following my conscience, and therefore no one can criticize me. Well, it's true conscience speaks with the voice of God if it's a correct conscience a conscience which corresponds to the truth. An erroneous conscience has to be corrected. It's part of the job of the authority figures in the New Testament to do this. And it has to be corrected according to the summary of the law. This is at the end of the Sermon on the Mount. But it could all be summarized in treat others as you would like to be treated. Do to others whatever you would have them do to you, what we used to call the golden rule. This summarizes the law and the prophets. Now, the unity which is seen between Abraham and Lot in respecting each other's places in the Old Testament kingdom is something which has to be reflected in the New Testament society, which is Holy Mother of the Church. That unity is communion in the Holy Trinity. It's based on the sacrament of orders because people are given holy orders in order to be fully a member of Christ's priest, prophet, and king. And part of being a prophet is telling the truth, and part of being a king is doing so with authority. But for this authority to be correct, it has to correspond to the truth. We can't say that, for example, I love Christ, and, but my Christ 
didn't institute the Eucharist to be the body, blood, and soul, and divinity of Christ. My Christ made a, a supper. Well, fine, one of us has to be right. And whoever's wrong, if they're loving that Christ, they're loving a figment of their own creation, not truth. We know today that in our society, truth is not held in high esteem. It's somehow considered to be culturally determined, which is rather strange when you think about it. But at the time in the history of the church, when Thomas More and John Fisher lived, there were certainly organs of authority. And these organs of authority, the bishops, for example, and then the pope, they guided us in the truth of our religion, in the truth of our faith. They guided John Fisher because he was a cleric, and they guided Thomas More because he was a layman. But each had to be guided according to their own vocation in this way. Now, all of you, I'm sure, have seen the movie The Man for All Seasons about the martyrdom of St. Thomas More. It's fairly well known. You remember that even though he was condemned to death by perjured testimony and a stacked jury, uh, he uh, died praying for the king and the realm. And then his famous line, I die the king's good servant, but God's first. But less is known about St. John Fisher. St. John Fisher was a professor at the University of Cambridge. He also, and this was unusual for the time, became chancellor of the university and was also the Bishop of Rochester. When the subject of Henry VIII's divorce came up from Catherine of Aragon, John Fisher was the only bishop in the English Episcopal Conference who denounced it. And then, when it was added to this, the document which made the king the head of the church on earth, for various reasons, perhaps political, perhaps because people were interpreting in a certain way, but again among the bishops, John Fisher was the only bishop who refused to sign the decree. For that he was imprisoned when he was in his 60s. He was imprisoned mercilessly in the Tower of London, and he'd been a friend of the king's before that also. He also was a great humanist and another, in addition to Thomas More, great scholar in Europe. He was also known to be a very saintly man. And when he finally refused admission not only to the divorce, but also to the supremacy of the king. He was condemned to death by treason, and one of Anne Boleyn's relatives sat on the jury. If that is an interest, I don't know what is. And uh, first he was condemned as a traitor because he'd been removed as bishop, so he was treated as a commoner. Condemned as a traitor to be hung, drawn, and quartered, but the king was afraid that he'd die on the feast of John the Baptist because the populace was very perturbed about this and they were identifying John, John Fisher's death with John the Baptist's at the hands of King Herod. So he had the sentence commuted to beheading and moved it to the day before. Again, before John Fisher died, he prayed for the king and for the realm, but he also died a loyal son of the Pope. He, did, he thought that signing the act of supremacy and he was correct would lead to the Pope's uh, denial in England. Now, what's important to learn about this is, first of all, the people who voted in the Episcopal Conference against, you know, Catherine of Aragon's marriage, but even more against the papacy being head of the church, were not acting in communion. And the same is true of the king as a layman. He was not acting in the communion of our church in the Holy Spirit. And as a result, their rights, in a sense, ceased to judge Christians. In the Man for All Seasons, Thomas More says, it's insufficient in law to charge anyone to obey this law. In John Fisher's case, it's especially poignant because he was so ill and so old that he had to be carried to the executioner's block in a chair. He couldn't even walk there himself. And yet, the king was merciless in this regard. Now, Lessons we need to learn from this are, first of all, we must act in communion. Communion with our bishops, communion with the Pope. Secondly, that not everything that's done by a bishop's conference is necessarily true. After all, we have the bishop's conference in England voting for the king to be head of the church, and then I don't know if you know this or not, but in Sweden, the whole hierarchy converted to Lutheranism all at once. 
It's one of the reasons why their Lutheran version of the church is more Catholic than any other, because there were certain elements they didn't deny. But it's important to see that everybody, it's true they should act according to their conscience, but their conscience has to be truly formed. And here you have both John Fisher and Thomas More shedding their blood for the sake of the communion of the church, the communion of the church, first of all, in their country, but even more than that, the communion of the church with the see of Rome. On their feast day, therefore, let us ask, he who does justice will live in the presence of the Lord, do unto others what you would have them do. We wouldn't want to be judged by judges who were biased or who were looking at the majority vote instead of to what the truth is. Let us pray also that in our church today we may constantly grow in affirming the truth of Christ, a truth for which both St. John Fisher and Thomas More died.